moving to a totally plant-based way of eating and living is literally infinitely better than imprisoning animals, destroying ecosystems, eating misery. And the Fillmore saw this back a hundred years ago very clearly. A single high fat meal that's high in animal fat and animal protein, since the animal protein itself tends to cause inflammation, can kill a person, literally. Let's praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. It says it right there. The animals are praising God. It's my job just to love, 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 love unconditionally and show it and, and mean it and be truthful about it and forgive easily. Small bios of our workshop leaders in your packet with the content of the workshops. And if you had a chance to look at that, you're going to see it's a powerful group with powerful presentations. So I'm just really grateful for all of them. I drove Sophia II to Missouri for the first ever Unity Village Vegan Spirituality Forum and Retreat. It was a sacred event intended to honor and resurrect the original teachings of Unity's founders. Co-founders Charles and Myrtle Fillmore became ethical vegetarians in 1895. Ethical vegetarianism, and that's what it was called back then, was part of the Unity identity. So all Unity people, I want you to know that. But this is a quote that came out as a statement from Unity in these early years. Unity opposes the use of any product that necessitates the taking of life whether it's food substance, wearing apparel, or general utility. So can you imagine a, a church body putting a statement out that like that today? You know, why not? But this is what this is how how strongly the Fillmore's felt about it. Charles and Murdoch Fillmore went right at it and said, this is how we spiritual beings need to be living. And he didn't make people wrong, didn't make, you know, didn't guilt me, it's not what they did at all. But they did hold to a standard. Like, this is the standard. You may or may not be at the standard, but this is the standard. Now, we all had our traditional food out there, whatever we were brought up with. And I remember one of my sisters asked me, why wasn't I eating the meatballs? And I said, well, I don't eat anymore. And they said, and she wanted to know why. And I said, and I told her why, you know, spiritual reasons. And I think it's wrong to kill animals and eat the meat. And she was very offended by that because she said, Mommy took care of us. Did she gave us all the love and all the goodness out there? And I was just so caught off guard and say, this doesn't have anything to do, Mommy. <laughs> but she took it as an attack on how we were brought up. When I was about six years old, I started bringing home little chipmunks that I found on the way home from school who had been flattened by autos in my lunchbox, took them home, and gave them a burial in my mother's rose bushes. I was a preacher's kid, this made sense, and it always ended with, may the force be with you, chipmunk. <laughs> or may the force be with you, squirrel. May the force be with you. Well, I, I wasn't really bringing raccoons yet. You know, they were a little large for my lunchbox. Uh, but that is where all of this started for me, this deep, deep understanding that there were beings that were dying around me that weren't treated the same way as the ones were that my father was taking care of in the funeral home. I also got kicked out of a ecumenical teen retreat where I was a panel speaker because I had found a little mouse at a pet store and liberated him into my pocket and got turned in for the alleged crime of bringing a rodent to church. <laughs> for which I cited many, many Bible verses. In my defense, I was given a small box to house the mouse. My father got a call about his rebellious preacher daughter and that's what started all of this. <laughs> I was a gay kid growing up in Texas in a conservative Christian household, and it didn't go well, as you can imagine. Um, I actually am a person who went through conversion therapy. So there was this moment in time where my parents, they loved me, but they loved me so much they felt they needed to save me. And so I went through this therapeutic practice, which was all about trying to help me not be gay anymore. And what, unfortunately, the outcomes of that were was a lot of internalized self-hatred, a lot of non-acceptance of myself deep down. 
And so as I was healing from that experience, as I, I got my own peace with God and with myself, and I went on a healing journey to try to unprogram some of those messages that I had taken on, what I realized was my parents were motivated by love, but their consciousness level wasn't such that they did no harm. They still harmed me. They didn't mean to, but they still harmed me. And that really opened up my mind to this concept of if we raise our consciousness, we'll stop harming. And I wasn't vegan at the time, but part of my healing journey was me becoming vegan because I realized, wait, my consciousness was also causing me to do harm to these animals by the way I was eating. And if I'm truly standing for nonviolence and non-harm, then I need to walk that talk in all areas of my life. And so that's what brought me to veganism. And uh, one of the things that I do in my life is I do a lot of ministry to the LGBTQ community, helping them heal from what I call identity harm, the, the challenges of being rejected for who you are, specifically in a spiritual context. And how we got here together is this spring, we, with William Melton and Victoria Moran, started a new community called Compassion Consortium. And right now we're meeting on Zoom. We meet on the fourth Sunday of each month. You're gonna get a taste today of what we do, but the idea is that we are interfaith, interspiritual, interspecies. The rose is a symbol of the spiral and the cyclical nature of life, okay? And it's an affirmation of your beauty, your power, your strength and the beauty of what is. And so you can use it and energize your intention. Or if you want your hands to be free, if you're very priestess style like myself and you like to move, you can find a holy place to leave it for now and walk the labyrinth and then bring it home with you this evening to be a part of your sacred prayer practice, okay? So let's begin by gently walking around in a circle a few times, setting the space, setting the energy. And then when it feels right, I'm going to invite Carol to begin. When you feel it's time to enter. Do you want us to go counterclockwise or clockwise? Okay, so we're going to be walking around clockwise. Yes. Blessings. And um, for the most part, the labyrinth mirrors the journey of life in that you go in, you enter in the same place where you exit, kind of like life. We experience, at least in my belief system, birth, death, so-called death, and rebirth, right? It's just a transition to a different form. And each day is a microcosm of that. You sleep, you wake up, you go back to sleep. Along the journey of life, there are twists and turns. The labyrinth is symbolic. And what you may experience is that any anxieties or doubts that we experience as humans in life in general, we tend to experience them on the labyrinth as well. So something very common is wondering if you've lost your path. How many of you have ever been like, wait, did I step outside the line? Did I? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then um, another aspect of the labyrinth is that in the center, how many of you have felt like an excitement when you get to the center of the labyrinth? OK, and it also can be an experience of finding yourself. The labyrinth can be used in a variety of ways if you want to work on boundary issues, for example. You can set an intention, you can think through whatever it is that you want to think through, or you can be in a receptive state. How is it that food affects our spiritual health? Well, again, the key can be found in Isaiah. In a prophecy concerning the Messiah, we're told that, uh, this is chapter 7, verse 15, essentially it says that the Messiah will eat simple foods that, quote, he may know how to refuse evil and choose good. So right there, the God is telling us that the food that you eat affects your ability to know right from wrong. Well, how does that happen? Well, I have a lecture called Diet and Brain Function that is on my website, and I want you guys to go and watch it when you can because it looks at the uh, construction of the human brain, and our circulatory system, and it helps to explain how food affects how our brain works. I can't go into all the detail I do in the lecture, but I'm gonna give you some uh, uh, kind of highlights. So imagine firemen fighting a fire on a three-story building. Clearly, they've gotta have enough pressure coming out of that water hose to reach the top floor, right? Well, your heart is here. Your brain is way up here. Turns out your brain gets 20% of your cardiac output. 3% of your body. Your brain only accounts for 3% of your body weight, but it gets 20%, one-fifth, of all the blood and oxygen put out by your heart. 
And that tells you just how dependent the, and, uh, the brain is on its oxygen supply. Well, <clears throat> the first part of the brain to receive blood is the brain stem, okay? The brain stem is where God placed our control of our blood pressure, heart rate, and breathing. So even if you pass out, the part of your brain that's going to get blood is going to keep you alive. The next part of the brain is called the midbrain. The midbrain is where your motivational forces are housed. That's where you find uh, your passions, your emotions, happiness, sadness, anger, surprise, disgust, and your sexual drive, okay, and hunger. All of that is in the limbic system in the midbrain. Then wrapped all around that and exerting a controlling influence on those midbrain passions is the cerebral cortex, okay, and that's where the thinking and consciousness takes place. So the cerebral cortex, in a sense, is the last place to receive blood. Now, what if somebody came and started punching holes in that fire hose when these firemen are trying to fight the fire on the uppermost floor? What's going to happen? The, yes, water pressure is going to fall. And that means that whoever's up on that upper floor is toast. And likewise, when you eat a big, heavy, greasy, unhealthy meal, a huge amount of blood has to be drawn off to supply your digestive tract. And suddenly, instead of having all this blood flowing to your uh, cerebral cortex, the cerebral cortex starts to be limited in the amount of blood and oxygen it's getting. And so what happens when people eat a big, greasy, unhealthy meal? They fall asleep. Because they're not perfusing their conscious areas. The other thing is they get irritable because those midbrain passions are now allowed to kind of play themselves out. And or, as we're often shown in the Bible, they become sexually inappropriate because the uh, ability to control their passions and their sex drive, they lose it. And it's just like they, you know, think, you know, my next door neighbor's kind of cute. <laughs> even though I'm married. Um, and so this is part of the way uh, uh, that, that, that food affects our brain. May you be happy. May you be free from suffering and fear. May you be healed. May you be at peace. is a capacity to make relevant connections. And when you're eating animal foods, you don't want to make those connections, right? We want to, no, 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 I don't want to think about what happened to the cow or the pig or the chicken or the fish, so I'm going to stay shallow. I'm not going to make the connections. Every single meal from the time we're little infants, we all conspire together to not go deep, to not think deeply, to not feel deeply, to not care deeply, to not comprehend deeply what we're doing. And when we do it with food, which is our most intimate connection with nature and with society, with our family, with everything, we stop, the, we block that. That's it. You have an entire society where the intelligence is severely suppressed. Real intelligence is severely suppressed. Not just cognitive intelligence, but even worse, emotional intelligence, affective intelligence, spiritual intelligence. They're all shut down. You shut that down. When you, when you force people to be the exploiters of other beings, which makes every, all of us ashamed of ourselves at a very fundamental existential level, then you have people that are easily manipulated, easily controlled, very gullible, believe anything, authoritarian, they'll, they'll go right along with an authoritarian program. School and education is about obeying authority. Animal agriculture is about this is what happens when you have the power and you dominate and exploit other beings. The thing to understand is it's not about blaming anyone, it's just understanding that we've all been wounded. We've all been born into a society where from the time of little infants, we're compelled to comply with and to engage in and to be molded by a system of violence. We're eating violence every single meal if we're eating animal foods. We're shutting down our natural intelligence to make the connections every single meal. Think about it, right? Here is nature telling us stop. That's what COVID-19 was. Nature's telling us stop it. You're done with this mode of living. So she, literally she put us in the chrysalis phase. So think about what you're doing. 
and come back out as a better human beings. And we decided to treat slaughterhouses as critical infrastructure. I mean, how serious are we at dealing with this crisis? So, I mean, our governments are not going to do this for us, okay? It's up to us to do this. Yeah. To get 3% of our food from the ocean, we are literally destroying the entire ocean, just, just for 3% of the food. But if you look at all the subsidies from the governments, it's going to animal foods. Worldwide, worldwide we are, um, there was an estimate that came out just a week ago saying that we are giving about $540 billion in subsidies to the animal agriculture industry. And in return, the animal agriculture industry is causing 12 to $14 trillion worth of damage every year. Right? And at that rate, you can take all the money that we have all collected worldwide, all the wealth of the planet, and you can't even use that to repair what we have done, what that industry has done. We have two different types of readings. Uh, one type of reading is going to be sharing the suffering of animals, and the other type of reading is going to be sharing the joys. So you can kind of pick, if you'd like to do <laughs> a suffering, <laughs> Uh, those are in orange, and the the joys are the sad ones, and the happy ones are in blue. Let's do suffering over here, joy over there. So in this ritual, we are extending our compassion of our hearts to the the animals through these readings. So we're actually going to take a moment and open our hearts to their suffering, and then. We'll take a moment to open our hearts to their joy. A young male mountain lion who wandered into Santa Monica to be shot and killed by frightened police, despite offers of non-lethal methods from a professional wildlife veterinarian. Chimpanzees and gorillas who are killed for the bushmeat trade and whose young are orphaned and left to die. Dolphins who are slaughtered for meat and whose young are captured and sold to aquariums and entertainment facilities. Wild Mustangs who are rounded up and sold at auctions for slaughter or adoption, all to protect public lands used as pasture for livestock. Seals and seal pups who are brutally killed to supply the fur and fashion industry each year. Calves who are taken from their mothers at birth without nursing, confined in small crates and fed an anemic diet before being slaughtered for the veal industry. Elephants in circuses who are chained 98% of the time and forced with bull hooks to do unnatural tricks for people. Any good news? <laughs> Costa Rica closed two zoos and banned circuses and sports hunting. In Defense of Animals has a program to provide support, mindfulness practices, nonviolent communication skills, and spiritual tools to angry animal rights activists. I put the angry in. <laughs> Good news. There are vegan spirituality meetups in eight cities with more sprouting up daily and bi-coastal vegan spirituality retreats. <laughs> eight countries have banned exotic animal circuses. Many United States and Canadian cities have en enacted legislation to severely restrict or a ban exotic animal acts. There is an increasing number of animal rights conferences, vigils, protests, and tablings in nearly every country. A prayer for compassion is being screened around the world. Is that all of the good news? <laughs> well, thank you so much for honoring the animals in this way, taking a moment to hear their suffering and to share their joy. Thank you, Carol and Judy and Lisa. Like this has been a, an amazing experience, a dream come true. Everybody saw the film last night and realizes that unity is a big part of why I'm vegan. And the Fillmores, even though nobody taught their teachings, it got through. So I want to thank Charles and Myrtle and just I can't think of a better place to premiere the new film and to screen the film last night. Um, 
But first, let's do a little church. Uh, and the other thing I want to say, too, is that about the new film, this is really going to be a docu-series, I'm pretty sure. And this is the last episode this weekend of the first season. So uh, this is why this is here. And this is why I got to get my preaching right. So bear with me. And uh, let's go to church. All right, here we go. Um, you know, I've taken the call of myself a evangelist. A evangelist. <laughs> That's because I got the gospel. Hallelujah. I got good news. Yes. You know, because gospel ain't nothing but a little good news. This past weekend, we've been here at Unity Village for the first time since the founding of Unity to have here at the headquarters of Unity a vegan gathering a retreat and a forum purely to celebrate the Fillmore's original vision of a spiritual path that is dedicated to compassion and respect and kindness for all living beings. It's well understood that Jesus and the original disciples were practicing what we would call vegetarianism or even veganism today because dairy was practically non-existent in the ancient world. So they were not eating animal foods. James, the brother of Jesus, has even said that he wouldn't wear wool, he only wore linen. And so we have this original movement based on compassion and justice uh, and a sense of humility and kindness and caring for the earth and for animals in the Christian tradition, but within a few hundred years that was lost, it was repressed. And today, of course, most Christian churches have barbecues and fish fries and so forth, and they would be very uh, insulted if we said that uh, Jesus was a vegetarian or a vegan, probably. Uh, and in a batter of maybe uh, 60 or 70 years, the original teaching of unity has also been covered over. But here, we've been resurrecting that vision. We've been resurrecting the vision of compassion, the original vision of Charles and Myrtle Fillmore, that there is one life living through all of us. And when we respect that life in others, we respect it in ourselves, and we celebrate it in ourselves, and it grows within our consciousness as love and healing, and as joy and freedom and peace and harmony and abundance, because we understand this now more and more clearly today through science and through the research that's been done, that a vegan way of living is the only way to live sustainably on this earth, especially with seven billion people. And this was seen clearly by them 100 years ago. And the film was understood that animal-based foods are filled with toxins. Charles Fillmore talks about that, that they're not healthy. But he really emphasizes something that I talk about in the World Peace Diet, which is that animal-based foods are filled with metaphysical toxins and with violence and misery and fear, which will make our own consciousness polluted not only by the physical toxins, but by the metaphysical toxins. So by moving to a vegan, plant-based way of eating and living, the Fillmores were encouraging everyone back then, 100 years ago, to sow the seeds of kindness and compassion in humanity. Oh my gosh, y'all, look, look who's here. Looky, looky, <laughs> Dr. Milton Mills is in Kansas City. Yes, I am. Oh my and gosh. I'm at Gigi's Wellness Cafe. Oh, look at that. We are super excited and honored to have him here in Kansas City. And I'm honored Kansas to be Cafe. here. After the retreat ended, Dr. Mills and I rode over to Kansas City, Kansas to be treated to a yummy meal prepared by Gigi the Vegan at her wellness cafe. I was diagnosed with colon cancer in 2015 and decided um, not to have surgery but to heal myself naturally. It's, it was a raw foods diet. I was raw for roughly about two years. But however, I went back to my doctor six months after living this lifestyle. And they couldn't find the cancer anywhere in my body, but they did see the dye where it was from, you know, the body scan and et cetera. And I, now I, what, five, six years later, I'm still vegan. I eat a 80-20 um, vegan lifestyle, and what that means is that 80% raw, 20% cooked, and I wouldn't go back to 
my old lifestyle for anything in the world. I feel fabulous. I have energy and I'm healed and I'm fabulous. <laughs> Thank you. While I was hanging out with Dr. Mills, I asked him if he could explain what might have caused my dad's stroke. Number one, your instincts are right. Um, what happened to your dad was uh, almost certainly related to the last thing he ate. We know that uh, meals that are very high in fat, particularly animal fat, because it's oxidized and very pro-inflammatory, will, first of all, the fat itself makes the blood start sludging. So instead of flowing through the arteries really smoothly, the red blood cells start to clump together. They um, uh, lose their ability to flow freely. And so they start sludging and clumping in, in the blood vessels to begin with. But then the fat also makes the blood what we call hypercoagulable, meaning much more likely to form clots. The problem is that when you have a, a meal that's high in fat, that fat affects the uh, endothelium, the cells that line the arteries in such a way they lose their ability to make what's called nitric uh, oxide, which helps the uh, artery dilate so that more blood can flow through. Um, or conversely, an area of the brain that's not being used, the arteries might contract down so that blood doesn't go there, it goes to where it's needed. But again, all of that is abolished. So suddenly the arteries can't react the way they're supposed to. The blood flowing through them is already sludging, and then it's more hypercoagulable. So if there's an area in an artery that's, say, partially blocked because of a cholesterol deposit, that is when you can get a clot formation at that area that will completely shut off blood flow distal to the blockage. And if it's in the heart, the person starts having symptoms of a heart attack. If it's in the brain, it causes a stroke because that means that every uh, um, a part of the brain that is supposed to be getting blood past that blockage is no longer getting blood flow and that will um, uh, cause a stroke. And so um, from what you have explained to me about what your dad was doing and what he ate, that is almost certainly what happened and what caused the problem. And I, you have my deepest sympathies. I, um, I, I know how hard that must have been to, to deal with that. Talking about my dad was a reminder of just how much I was failing in my quest to bring the elixir of veganism home to my family. And I wondered how many more funerals I would attend before I was able to. Until then, for the sake of my daughter and all the children of the planet, I will continue to spread the gospel and encourage each of us to find more ways to bring more compassion into our world. You know, I've taken to calling myself a veganjelist. A veganjelist. Because I got the gospel. Hallelujah! Woo! Woo! I got the good news. Because you know, gospel ain't nothing but a little good news. And the good news that I'm here preaching to you today is that the more you align yourself with your true compassionate nature, the better you're going to feel. The more energy you're going to have, the more peace you're going to experience, the more connection you're going to feel to all of life, to animals, to people, to whatever spiritual or religious path you're on. Because I have a gift. I have a gift that can change your life and bring more magic into your world. And it is the gift of spiritual alignment. And it is the good news. It is the gospel. And it is the reason I've started calling myself a evangelist. I love you all. Take care of yourself.
Namaste. Namaste.